for those of you who don't know me, I'm Anil Mankar, co-founder co and development officer at uh, Brainship. And I'm going to be talking about uh, Neural Network SOC Akira uh, 1000 into this uh, interesting uh, this conference. I just uh, I will go through our uh, Brainship Akira event domain neural processor as uh, Lil mentioned. This is out of becoming a AI. Uh, CPU um, neural processing conference. So I'm pleased to really announce our first neural processor at this conference called Akira 1000, which is a neural SOC. Uh, we'll also uh, talk about the power performance analysis from standard DNN that can be converted into a, a SNN and run on our Akira platform. I will also introduce uh, our on-device training that we do, uh, our uniqueness in that. And I'll give you a couple of uh, video demos of age AI learning. So, uh, and then I'll summarize my presentation. So about Brainchip, uh, we are uh, we actually are focused on bringing AI to the edge device at a very low power and high performance, ultra uh, sm small size. And that is also includes uh, age AI training, um, which I'll go into details uh, on the next slide. As we talked about, uh, uh, Lil mentioned in his talk about uh, being a convolution uh, architecture, sparse space and uh, binary uh, uh, networks. I will address each of those. So we are basically what we have at Akida. Akida means uh, spikes. And what we have done is we actually created a human domain neural processor that can process neural networks. Now here uh, we are actually, what we do is we take activations and convert those to events. So both for activation and weights, uh, we can actually convert those into events and we do processing, all the processing to event domain, which are spikes. So we are we are taking the convolution architecture further to doing convolutions in event domain. And also because of that, we benefit from uh, sparsity of both activation and weights. While a lot of architecture can actually take advantage of sparsity of weights, maybe by doing some pre-processing of weights, uh, we actually take activation uh, sparsity also into account because the activation sparsity will vary from each frame and uh, each inference uh, object as given. So uh, advantage of taking the computation of uh, neural network processing into human domain is that we benefit from both activation sparsity and weight sparsity so we do not have to do anything to the uh, pre-processing pre of the neural networks uh, or pruning of the neural networks. We take the DNN as it is and process it in the human domain. Uh, he also mentioned about binary neural networks. Uh, a lot of analysis that we have done, uh, we realized that while binary net networks are very good at uh, reducing memory footprint, some of the networks do need uh, additional um, the accuracy lost uh, in binary neural network can be recovered by allowing you to take the both activation and weights to one, two, or four bits. So we allow uh, the event domain processor to have both uh, weights and activation quantized down to uh, four bits or two bits, depending on your network. Uh, of course, when you quantize it, uh, there's a relative accuracy drop, uh, but then you can choose whether you want to go all the way down to binary or ternary networks, or have two bits activation or two bits weights, or even go up to four bits if your network is so. All of this optimization of uh, weights and activation, you can actually do it by layer by layer. So that actually takes uh, the memory requirement for running the network at the edge, uh, uh, reduces, uh, you can fit that into a very small memory footprint. So by going into event domain, what we have done is reduce the total number of competitions that are required uh, to run an inference and also the amount of memory that is required. What we talk about, uh, our units are neural processing unit and we can uh, allow them to run um, in multiple layers in parallel. So we have you know, um, multiple neural networks, NPUs that our Akira IP has. And because we can really do uh, multiple uh, Layers in parallel, we get higher performance. We basically are pipelining the computation that is required for each layer. All of our NPUs actually communicate over a uh, private mesh network. 
So the neural network is actually running on our complete uh, fabric. You don't really need external CPU to run the neural processing unit. Uh, so we actually are the full network on our hardware that has all the self-contained uh, NPUs with all the memory and uh, weights that is required. We, we run the full network in hardware. Because we have taken and we do competition in human domain, we actually also have on-chip learning, which allows us to do uh, edge uh, training, and I'll go into more details on that. So what we have done is we have a Akira, which is the event-based neural processor. It can process standard DN, convert them to SNN, do the competition and run in this, or you can do uh, um, direct processing of events as we, as we go into further details. So this is our first product we are introducing and we're happy to introduce our first uh, in, uh, neural SOC uh, at the, um, Little conference. So as you can see, uh, what we are, this chip will be available second uh, half of the year. We actually uh, have uh, of this uh, Akita NPUs that we have actually put in an Akita neural fabric. And we can bring in the data from the host processor where the application is running either through PI or UAV. Simply what, uh, or you can have direct interface to uh, the audio sample through I2S or I2C, which is sensor data directly coming in. So the data can come in from either USB, PCIe, or I2S or I2C. And then once we take the data, we actually generate events from the data. On-chip uh, event generator will either take your standard uh, camera, frames from standard camera, convert, convert those into events, or it could also take standard up either coming from audio data or other sensor data all the standard uh, data coming from uh, PCIe, USB, and convert those into events. Having converted all of uh, the data into events, we actually run the processing of the complete uh, neural network on our uh, available number of NPUs in our chip. Uh, if the uh, network uh, that you are using uh, doesn't have enough NPUs on our chip, then there's actually a chip to chip communication where multiple chips can be connected together and uh, the events from uh, one of the uh, NPUs in one chip can be transmitted over a high-speed multi-chip expansion bus that we have. The M-class CPU that you see here is actually a M4 CPU, ARM M4. Its function is to really take um, the neural network description that has been converted to, uh, into event domain and configure all the Akira core, program each of the NPUs from the parameters and run the, let the net network run on on the Akira fabric. So typical use case of this will be that the host processor where the application is running sends the data over USB or PCIe. Uh, the M4 class CPU uh, has a, um, has a uh, runtime monitor that actually configures uh, the uh, Akira fabric, manages uh, the complete network, and the result of that are stored uh, into the external LPDDR, which is optional. Uh, where the data coming from the host goes into the external LPDDR. The Akira fabric, uh, once it's configured, picks up the data, processes it, and puts the results back there. Now, optionally, we can use the LPDDR for storing some additional weights if we need to. Um, so that is the chip that is being, uh, uh, will be available soon on a reference board. Here's some of the uh, scalability of the Akira architecture that you see. So you can take a CNN, and convert it into uh, once uh, SNN, I will talk about that uh, in the next slides. But once you have converted it, the scalability of the Akira architecture, uh, either you have enough of those uh, nodes or a chip available on a board, and you can do what we call a one-step uh, inference. That means all, all the layers of the neural network can be mapped to amount of hardware required. Now, as the data comes in, the hardware actually we can do and give you inference. In case your network doesn't fit, and you want to run it on a single chip, then you can take those uh, layers, um, map it to the number of amount of hardware available, and store the intermediate results in the LPDDR or external memory that you might have, and do it sequentially. So our architecture is very, very scalable. We can go from very small uh, networks to large networks uh, and uh, process them uh, sequentially or a single shot. 
So this is how uh, the chip uh, uh, diagram. Uh, you can see uh, there are about 20 nodes, uh, 80 NPUs. We actually have uh, each uh, four of the NPUs connected as one node, and they communicate over each other within the four nodes, and the nodes actually communicate over a mesh network. This is actually a layout from the chip uh, that shows you 20 nodes. The biggest block that you see here is actually LP DDR controller, 32 bit DDR controller. And uh, then we have a PCIe and USB. Let's move this here. Yeah, so I hope that is uh, showing everything. So you see PCIe, USB uh, on the right side. ARM processor is here. This is LPDDR. These are all the 20 nodes. These nodes actually are uh, laid out such that they abut next to each other. So they know. Uh, so and this this becomes a part of the IP. This technology is actually implemented currently in a 20 nanometer HPC technology. Uh, can run up to 300 megahertz. Uh, typical power is two watts, and the evaluation boards will be available pretty soon. Now, uh, this is the, uh, what we are really compare is how does uh, the event domain processing compare to a standard deep neural network, which is MacBase Accelerator. So because uh, on, on the left, left graph is actually the Giga Max required for influence for some of the networks that we have analyzed. And you can see that because uh, activations are also uh, converted to events and, and weights also treated as events, the total number of competition that are reduced to, uh, required uh, to, to do are actually almost like 50% less than uh, the standard DLA that we'll have to do. So we have analyzed MobileNet V1, MobileNet SSD, similarly MobileNet um, uh, Yellow V2, and this graph shows on the left the amount of competition uh, reduced that's required for inference. While on the right side, it shows because we have been quantizing to uh, one, two, or four bits, most of these are four bit quantization and uh, two bit memory, uh, amount of memory that's required to run inference also goes down. So those are the two basic uh, advantage uh, compared to a standard DLA. And we have uh, done quite a bit of analysis of uh, standard benchmark networks. And the way to look at it was the, the design space of uh, your CNN that you want to run. The, there are two parameters that are really decide uh, what, how much, uh, how big a hardware you need. Uh, one is the total number of parameters uh, for the network and how many max are required, or max per second that you need to uh, perform for doing an inference. So we show that uh, just a two node, that means eight cores, can actually done a standard uh, audio keyword spotting at 30, 30 words per second, or mobile net uh, uh, V1 uh, with a 96 um, uh, V1 that has a, a smaller size. And you can do a Google uh, a person detection network, whether the uh, visual wake word, uh, what Google calls. We can do that at 4.6 milliwatts. The very small network that can run on two, two nodes, or you can run uh, um, uh, other custom uh, hardware that we have, which does gesture recognition, that can be running at 642 microwatts. Similarly, mobile net SSD or mobile net V1, uh, yellow V2, those are different parameters here. So depending on the size of the neural network, number of parameters, and uh, how, how many max you, uh, you need, we have uh, analyzed quite a few of solutions uh, that will run on Akida. So how do we uh, do that? We actually have a complete software development stack and training flow. We uh, show we can take a standard CNN and convert that into a uh, event-based domain uh, to uh, on Akida hardware platform. So what we have is we have a tool flow in standard support TensorFlow Keras, uh, out from TensorFlow Keras and Python packages. We have a full chip simulator and it, um, and 
Python script that will convert your CNN to SNN, and I will show, uh, show you how we go through that. And we also, all the things that we analyze are available as models. Uh, is, this is all on our uh, website. So typically what you do, you, you take uh, your standard CNN, let's say mobile V1 or keyword spotting or SSD. You take those model. Now you create a Akira by level model, which we actually support convolutions, uh, all three by three kernel, five by five kernel, seven by seven kernel. And uh, once you map it to Akira simulator, you actually um, do that uh, quantization uh, or aware training because you want to go down to one to four bits. All of this done completely in a TensorFlow Chaos environment. And you save the network uh, in, in the output format for TensorFlow Chaos, and you bring that in, and then you can analyze how many um, how many cores you'll need to run that network and what accuracy will be. So all of the accuracy, the network that you have, we do not have to change. We don't have to change the architecture of the network. What you're taking it below eight bit quantization, you need to uh, uh, training. Let me go to the, all of this uh, is available at our website that uh, actually you see. Um, here, uh, this, this software uh, is completely available. Uh, you can go install the software, uh, the st standard uh, uh, Python scripts and TensorFlow Chaos. If you are familiar with that, you can install it. Let me show you an example there, user guide, APIs. And let's take a look at a couple of examples that are already available on the website, which actually take keyword spotting or mobile key one. We have done C410, VGG, GXNOR, MNIST. Let me take you to one of the examples. Here we actually, uh, for a keyword spotting example, all the commands are given. You can actually go through and uh, map the network. Once the network is mapped, you see the, what the results uh, of the network will. Uh, you actually take uh, a chaos model satisfying the energy requirements. Then you actually go and retrain it uh, uh, with a uh, initial network, and you see that the accuracy uh, when you go down from four bits to um, uh, four bits and four bit activation is the drop is not that much. Uh, if you're happy with that. You actually save uh, save the network in a TensorFlow Chaos format. You can run uh, uh, the accuracy, check the performance of that. Once the network is converted, you will see how many. Uh, then we analyze uh, in TensorFlow and Chaos how what the what the um, sparsity is for uh, activation and weights, and then we can predict what the um, power and performance will be. And you can really see it. Uh, this is the result on a get a Yes. I'm, I'm afraid we need to wrap up and get to the Q&A. OK, OK, quickly. Let me just quickly uh, go to the demo that I need to show you quickly. So this is the learning that we see. Uh, we can actually take the last layer, replace it by Akira learning. And let me show you a demo of uh, age learning. Once we, we have taken a mobile net V1 and replaced the last layer. Uh, with um, uh, 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 training enable, and we can show you one shot learning um, that you'll see by learning from an object. So what has happened is last layer doesn't know any new classification. We take the first, uh, we, we take it the background, um, we label it as we're showing one object, we are labeling it. So the network is learning in the age from the single object that was present. Moose, tiger, uh, Okay, thank you, Anil. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. And we, we will show you the demo. Uh, there will be live demo in a breakout session. And so, uh, yeah, yeah you, you can turn off your screen sharing. We'll start the Q&A. Okay. And so, yeah, as, as Anil said, you'll have an opportunity to uh, have more discussion with him in the breakout session uh, later on today. So, uh, so it is an, a very interesting architecture. Uh, you said it's event-driven, but it basically you would call this a spiking neural network. Is that correct? 
Yes, that is correct because of what we are processing is we are basically, our basic hardware is spiking the network, we process spikes. What we are doing is we take uh, uh, the events or the activation also and convert those into events. We actually also process spikes directly come from DVS camera. We actually had a demo of a DVS camera in my slides and in the slide you can see. So we can learn directly from spikes coming in or if you give me data, then I convert those to spikes and then process them. So for, for processing pixels, uh, you have in your block diagram the, the pixel converter. Um, do you need an ISP or do you have that built into your chip for processing video? No, we don't really do ISP. We actually start with the frames. Let's say you have HD camera, 2 million pixel. We actually do a convolution. The first layer is a convolution on that, like the ImageNet 224 by 224 by 3, so 3 filter. After we do the first 8-bit convolutions on the data, then we actually have some thresholding logic that creates into events uh, uh, from the action. So we don't really, we do not have our IPs. Oh, okay. So the, uh, if you're doing quantization down to one bit, uh, is there any difference really between that and a binary neural network? Uh, no, if you can, uh, like the CIFAR 10 network that we showed, uh, it, it was actually going to binary net network. It really depends on, uh, you have a choice uh, with us. If you have a binary neural network and you're happy with the accuracy, you can, you can run it on our hardware. If you're not happy with the accuracy, then you can add, uh, go up into the number of bits used for activation and, uh, and weights. So we give you a choice. Okay. So we, get, we have a few questions coming in from the audience. Uh, one of the questions has to do with uh, what, what practical applications do you target uh, with the ability to, to learn? Yeah, I think uh, it's not yeah, so it's, it's very learning, good. actually learning when you've already deployed the device. Yeah, very good question. What we do is, uh, let's, say, uh, you, you, let's say you had a mobile net V1 and somebody running on our network. Now you have in, on a factory floor, you have 10 objects that you want to classify. Rather than having to create multiple samples of those 10 objects, you can just show it, uh, turn on the uh, last layer in classification, like I was showing you background and tiger and things like that. Uh, you just show the objects and it learns from the, the when the object is in front of the camera, is actually going through the events that are going through the initial layers. The features were extracted from the initial layer, but the last layer, Neuron, which is fully connected, now learns from those events that were coming in and you, like, you label it. So you could have a set of 10 objects on one factory floor that you can classify between them. If next week you want to add a couple more objects, you just don't need to go back to the uh, cloud to retrain them, have multiple samples of that. With a single shot or a couple of shots, you can learn to classify between the set of objects that you want to do. One of the, the, um, yeah. One of the unique ahead. things I think about, about your chip is you can actually handle uh, any time series data, right? That's correct. So is that, I would think with the, the, the self-learning would be especially uh, valuable for, for big data problems. That's true. We actually have done something similar. We took uh, cyber secret data, that means the internet packets, uh, look at the header data, and you can, you, you know, you can process that big data, find out which are good packets and bad packets, and you can learn, you can encode those to spikes. So you can have a software to do encoding of spikes, and then you can learn from those spike patterns and you can now uh, once having the uh, it's a very small couple of layer network that can knows between a good packet and a bad packet and now you can turn it on you just observe uh, internet packet at line speed and it will tell you of known packets that are required yeah. so it, it's possible to do that yes okay uh one of the other questions from the audience is whether you could use akita for i believe uh, something like audio processing uh uh, long short short term memory type of applications. Uh, so, right, uh, in the current architecture, no, we don't really support long term short term memory because we are doing a DNN. But uh, next generation, we are looking at how to do uh, recurrent networks and uh, and those kind of things. Right now, we are doing standard CNN uh, audio processing. We do in terms of gunshot wound or keyword spotting that actually runs right now. But for storing memory multi-level, then we, we probably will be working on that uh, for next generation. When you're, when you're doing the training, uh, a couple of questions that. So first of all, how long uh, does it typically take to adapt uh, a network to Akita? And then does it do the mixed precision on a layer by layer basis? How does that work? 
Yes. So uh, typically, when you let's say you start with mobile net V1 or, or standard CNN, you actually stay in TensorFlow KOS and you actually figure out how low can because you are doing a quantization of a training. This is typically what people are doing also. So you do that, you analyze it. Uh, but you can decide each layer whether you need four bits or two bits depending on the accuracy loss you have. Now you are doing that training in back back propagation in the cloud directly when the conversion is happening. After you are converted and decided on a 30 layer network where accuracy drop was not much and what did you need, it, so that was okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, we also have questions. I, I had the same question in my mind. You, you mentioned you're selling the chip, but you're also offering this as IP. Yes, we do that, offer the, yes. Go ahead. Yeah, so we actually, while we implemented the chip, that might go into a couple of uh, video and later application. Main, main target is the IP, and this is where I was talking in my slide. You can configure, you can decide, depending on the size of the embedded uh, chip that you want to do, you can decide to have two nodes or four nodes IP, and the IP comes with the data to event converter, or multiple number of nodes. Now. You can analyze how many different type of networks you want to really uh, have solution uh, on on your embedded device and choose that many nodes. And then you can use them as single pass or a multi pass if the network is bigger than the size you selected. Okay, that's great. And then is it higher IP or is it synthesizable IP? No, it's a, actually just a standard sales and, and RAM. Uh, we can, you can synthesize to any network. We are process agnostic. agnostic. While the current implements in 20 nanometer, we can go to any 14, 16, 7 nanometer. We'll actually help you with uh, help the customers with synthesis, synthesis scripts and full simulation. It's a RTL IP basically. It, is not, it doesn't use any uh, idiosync uh, processes, uh, idiosyncrasies. Okay. Um, we have one more question about uh, difficulty of converting from TensorFlow. Uh, is there an advantage to developing na neural networks natively as a spiking neural network? Is there a way to do that or do you rely on the conversion process? No, we do actually have uh, like the hand, uh, DBS guest that is in my presentation that was the directly learning from the uh, events coming in. So you can actually do an, our same hardware can run a native neural network or a uh, converted CNN. So that's not a problem. Okay. Well, I think uh, we're out of time. This is a, a very interesting talk. Uh, thank you, Anil. Thank and you very much. And uh, please join us at the breakout session. Okay. Thanks.